Welcome everyone to the 26th annual Golden Apple Award Ceremony, honoring Professor Ryan Ball. My name is Erica Mandel, and I am one of the co-chairs of this year's Golden Apple Award Committee. I would like to start off by thanking some, but certainly not all, of the people who made this event possible. First, thank you to Michigan Hillel for all of the support. To Davey Rosen, the Golden Apple Award Advisor and Associate Director of Hillel, thank you for giving us the direction and advice we need to be successful each and every year. To Hillel's graphic designer, Livia Chow, thank you for the countless hours you have put into helping us produce our advertising materials, including the incredible poster of Professor Ball. I would also like to thank <laughs> our many university department sponsors, which you'll see listed in our program. Without their support, none of the preparation and planning leading up to this event would have been possible. Thank you to the Ross School of Business Accounting Department, whose enthusiasm and support for Professor Ball and our committee has been so appreciated. It was incredible to see the majority of Professor Ball's colleagues join us in surprising him in the announcement of this year's award. I would also like to thank my co-chair, Talia Schlesinger, and the rest of the Golden Apple Award Committee, whose hard work and dedication over the course of this entire academic year is what makes tonight possible. The Golden Apple Award draws its inspiration from a quote by the third century sage, Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus, who instructed his students, get your lives in order one day before you die. However, no one knows when his or her last day will be, so we must act as if today will be our last. The Golden Apple Award honors those teachers who consistently treat every lecture as if it were their last chance to impart knowledge on their students who engage each student to think critically and inspire discourse outside of the classroom, and who do so enthusiastically. <laughs> the Golden Apple Award is intended to encourage, to encourage meaningful conversations and relationship building between professors and students beyond the lecture hall, something that this year's winner, Professor Ball, particularly excels at. The nature of the Golden Apple Award as the only student-given and student-run teaching award on campus makes it a highly prestigious honor. In looking at the list of past recipients, one can see that great professors can be found in every department and school in Michigan. Law, history, psychology, English, chemistry, nursing, business, and the list goes on. Although we can only honor one winner each year, we want to acknowledge the impressive work that goes on across our campus. We would also like to take a minute to specially honor our past recipients. We want to thank all of the Golden Award, all of the Golden Apple Award recipients, again, for their dedication to their students and the positive contributions they make to this university. You are an invaluable part of our university learning experience. This year marks the 26th annual Golden Apple Award. The last several years illustrate the growing influence the award has had on Michigan's campus. Increasing attendance rates for the annual last lecture events and consistently reaching over 1,000 student nominations each year, including 150 nominations for this year's winner, Professor Ball. This record-breaking number of nominations for any one professor is truly a testament to Professor Ball and the influence he has on his students. In fact, we were so jarred by the sheer number of nominations for Professor Ball that we even checked the authenticity of the unique names that nominated him <laughs> to ensure he was the real deal. Yeah. And after reading the quality of his nominations and the incredible sentiments his students expressed, it was clear that Professor Ball really is the real deal. In this 26th year of the Golden Apple Award, we have once again found a professor who demonstrates a pure love of learning and a tremendous commitment to his students. His method of teaching inspires others and it is clear that he is equally respected by his colleagues and his students. Numerous MBA students expressed in their nominations for, profess for Professor Ball that he is a unique way of making accounting a notoriously dry subject matter <laughs> Fun, exciting, and engaging. Since surprising Professor Ball with this honor, our selection has only been reaffirmed. 
In our meetings with Professor Ball, we have been able to experience just a sliver of his dedication, passion, and humor that his students are fortunate enough to enjoy every day. And now, to introduce Professor Ball, former Ross Student Government President, Joe Tate. I'm so glad I didn't trip up the stairs coming up. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Joe Tate, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business and School of Natural Resources. Tonight, I have the distinct honor of introducing Professor Ryan Ball as this year's recipient of the Golden Apple Award, the only university-wide teaching award organized and voted on by students. As many people in the audience know, business school professors throughout the country use a common tool to create discussion in their classrooms. This is called cold calling. <laughs> cold calling occurs when the professor asks a student questions on the day's required reading or his or her opinion on the topic at hand, essentially quizzing a student during class in front of his or her peers. Now, if you are a student that has read and prepared for the day's class, more times than not, you feel poised and confident. If you did not prepare, well, there may be a feeling of uncertainty if called upon. The professors use cold calling with varying levels of delight to reinforce the content of the curriculum as well as create opportunities for real, real world practical application. How well does one respond in the classroom correlates to how well does one respond in a business setting when you receive an anticipated or unanticipated question from either your supervisor or a client. Professor Ball and I first met through a cold call in this corporate financial reporting course. I cannot exactly remember what question he asked me, but the structure of my response was built upon run-on sentence, sentences and what I thought were accounting buzzwords. <laughs> After what seemed to be an eternity of prattle, he extracted a key word from my answer and proceeded to move forward with the course. <laughs> Although that was our first interaction, I'm happy to say that that has not been our last. Accounting is the language of business. From startups to multinational corporations like Michigan's own GM, accounting tells the story of a company's finances for both internal use and for external parties, such as shareholders and potential investors. Since accounting is a language of business, our accounting professors can be considered language teachers. Like all teaching, there's an art and science to communicating the content of the information to the students. I believe Professor Ball does an outstanding job in balancing the two. But more importantly, he communicates a sense that he cares for his students. During my accounting course with Professor Ball, his office door was always open to his students. And in addition, he would hold uh, mergers and acquisition tax accounting workshops for us. And actually, most recently, he held one earlier this year on Valentine's Day. <laughs> There's no better way to say I love you than mergers and acquisitions <laughs> tax account. <laughs> Expressions like this have endeared Professor Ball to his students because while we intuitively know he is a subject matter expert in the field of accounting, he also genuinely is concerned with his students' understanding of the accounting content. In summary, Professor Ball embodies the spirit of the Golden Apple Award, consistently teaching each lecture as if it were his last, and striving not only to disseminate knowledge, but to inspire and engage students in its pursuit. Before I give the floor over to Professor Ball, I would be remiss if I did not share his background. He is a native of Ohio. Please don't hold that against him. <laughs> he began his professional career as a structural engineer 
earning his bachelor's and master's of science from engineering of engineering at Ohio University. Furthermore, he went on to earn his MBA and PhD in accounting from the University of North Carolina's Kenan Flagler Business School. Prior to Professor Ball arriving in Ann Arbor, he was an assistant professor of accounting at the University of Chicago. Professor Ball currently serves as an assistant professor of accounting and Ernst & Young faculty fellow at the Ross School of Business. Please give, me a warm, please give him a warm welcome in welcoming <laughs> Professor Ball. Lights are so bright, I can't see. Wow, there are a lot of people out there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for showing up. Uh, uh, I'm still in shock over winning this award. I, uh, for those of you that were there uh, or even weren't there, uh, three weeks ago I was lured down into the winter garden <laughs> under false priest tenses that I would be uh, having lunch with five of my students. And there was a quite a, a, a long moment of uh, awkwardness that, uh, where one of my students tried to convince me they were gonna start a flash mob. I'm still waiting for that flash mob. <laughs> but they surprised me with this Golden Apple Award. And I'll tell you, I, I literally haven't been the same since because I just appreciate the outpouring of support. And at the end of the day, I feel a little bit ridiculous receiving it uh, in the sense that uh, you know, I just show up and I try to do my job, uh, and I get paid for what I do. And uh, so, <laughs> my department chair is here, so not enough, uh, by the way. <laughs> no, no, but in all seriousness, you know, uh, everybody's got to find their passion in life, and I'm lucky to have found mine, and uh, I'm really honored that you guys would honor me this way. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, but you know, the honor isn't all just mine. It, uh, uh, a lot of great people go into making a great professor, and I just wanna quickly acknowledge some of those. First of all, Joe, I, I, I've gotta uh, acknowledge Joe Tate, who gave me this wonderful introduction. Uh, Joe, I can't say enough about you. Uh, Joe is, as many of you know, but those that don't, Joe is one of the most humble guys I've ever met in my life, and he would never boast about himself uh, so I'm going to for a couple of minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Joe is, uh, he's got a wide background. He, uh, he was a captain of the Michigan State football team, played professional football for a number of years, served in the military, and eventually wound up in my accounting class. And Joe, I do remember you, uh, me cold calling you. And uh, it was on the statement of cash flows. I do specifically remember that. <laughs> And I appreciate that you said I found one nugget of uh, truth there. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I've gotten to know Joe uh, over the last year and a half, and I can't tell you how impressed I am with his uh, citizenship. Uh, Joe, I'm honored to have taught you a little bit about accounting, but I can tell you, you've taught me a heck of a lot about leadership, and uh, I'll never forget you for that. Uh, I also understand that Joe is the mastermind behind organizing the vote for this award. <laughs> and so Joe, absolutely. Joe, I truly, I truly believe that the, the, their voting in a record turnout is uh, not only a function of my teaching, but also their respect for you. So I uh, completely appreciate that. Also the Golden Apple Award uh, Committee. Uh, one of the uh, interesting parts about my job is I don't actually interact at all with undergraduates period. As a matter of fact, I just literally realized that my first interaction were with Talia and Erica as part of this process for the Golden Apple Award. And I got to tell you, I am super, super impressed. You guys have done an A plus job all across the board. Normally when somebody organizes an event like this for you, you're concerned that they're going to live up to your expectations. I can assure you the opposite is true where I'm afraid I may not live up to your lofty expectations because you set the bar extremely high, and I appreciate everything you and the rest of the committee have done uh, for me and all of the other students involved, okay? And then last but 
but certainly not least, actually it's the most important, it's the students. My God, my students, I read feedback all the time in terms of the qualitative comments you leave me, uh, both in the mid-course evaluations and the formal uh, evaluations. And I gotta tell you, I see words like, Professor Bald is energetic, he's enthusiastic, uh, he's uh, uh, passionate. That's only because you guys come to class and make me want to be passionate. You make me want to be energetic and you make me want to be enthusiastic and I couldn't do it without you. If you could just do me a favor, I've got my family in the audience. I'd like to, if, if you are a student in my class, could you just stand up so you can be recognized and they can uh, see what great people I teach? Wow, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, being a huge part of my life and allowing me to be a small part of yours. Uh, I'll forever appreciate that. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> with that killing off uh, three minutes, they told me I should, had another half hour or an hour to kill, so uh, <laughs> I had to come up with something, so here we go, okay? All right, all right. So one of the questions that I often get asked by my students, usually in office hours, is Professor Ball, <laughs> and they say it with a little bit of cynicism, why did you go into the field of accounting in the first place? I wish I could say that my life's calling all along, uh, it was my life's calling all along, and that I simply executed some master plan. In reality, I spent the first four years of my life uh, as a structural engineer designing buildings until I stumbled into accounting by sheer coincidence. But however, believe it or not, it's captivated me ever since. In his earlier comments, uh, Joe pretty much nailed it on the head when he described accounting as the language of business that tells a story about a company. But I also like to think about accounting as a bit more broadly as a science of measurement. And measurement affects every walk of life because measurement is how we go from knowing anything, or from not knowing anything, to having some idea of what's going on around you. Measurement is like repeatedly stumbling around in a dark room until you have some idea of where the furniture is in there. But the darkness never goes away, and it's something that all of us have to grapple with. The important thing is that measurement alone is not the answer. Most students come in to class thinking that I am there to show them how to turn on the light. Instead, my job is to disappoint them and make them get comfortable and help them prepare for the perpetual darkness of ambiguity inherent in uncertain things that accounting can never hope to measure. I often tell students that, quote, the most important thing that you will take away from this class is knowing what you don't know. And that's okay because that's where you add value as a person. Outside of the classroom, important decisions we face such as deciding whether to take a job or return back to graduate school have always been involved and will always involve managing ambiguity effectively. In our rapidly evolving world with amazing new technologies and a turbulent presidential campaigns, what matters most is not what we know and can measure. It's how we deal with what we don't understand. Accounting, among other facets of my life, has provided me with the necessary tools for confronting ambiguity and harness its extraordinary potential. Having said that, I have a confession to make. I have not always been the cool guy you see before you. <laughs> it's true. You laugh, and I know most of you won't believe me, but I'll show you the proof here in one second. <laughs> what you're about to see has been locked away in a safe for the past 25 years. Only one other person on earth has ever seen this. And we have a bet, she bet that I would not be willing to show it. <laughs> and she's about ready to lose that bet. But I think I'm gonna end up being on the losing end of the stick, okay? <laughs> Just to prove to you that I wasn't always the cool guy that I used to be. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> That's really relieving. <laughs> Which I want to point out for those of you that did not connect the dots, that's me at my prom. Uh, and believe it or not, that's my wife. 
Uh, we've been together for 25 years, and she's just as beautiful today as she was back then. I and their no. <laughs> Uh, I, on the other hand, discovered LASIK and hair product. <laughs> oh, man. Why did I do that? All right. All right, continuing on. <laughs> Looking back 25 years and 40 pounds ago, I realized that I was not well equipped to deal with ambiguity. I hated ambiguity because it was extremely uncomfortable to deal with. So I went out of my way to avoid it and hope that it would eventually go away. Oh, God. All right. In high school and as an undergraduate, I gravitated towards the higher sciences, such as engineering, where I could take comfort in knowing that there was always a right answer in the back of the textbook to check my thought process. All that effort was driven towards finding the answer, not for the sake of discovery, but rather for the comforting feeling of having found a piece of furniture in that dark, dark room. I would cling on to that piece of furniture for dear life, which meant that I was really, really wasn't going anywhere. I had to find the light switch, but there was never one to be found. So, with all of that formality out of the way, I want to spend our remaining time together telling you three stories that have come to personify different aspects of how I approach ambiguity today. My hope is that these will inspire you to find and tell your own stories, but as, at a minimum, I expect it will be an interesting and very entertaining way to spend our remaining time together. So, having said that, story number one. Story number one is about Denmark. And it's about setting expectations appropriately in the face of ambiguity. I do apologize to my students. I know about half of the audience here has been in my class before because you've heard the story because I actually told it during the Microsoft case that I taught. But it bears repeating, because I like it. All right, so Denmark. Take a look at this guy right here. Many of you will recognize him as international accounting superstar Hans Christensen. <laughs> to me, I like to call him my best friend. Hans and I started working at the University of Chicago right out of our PhD programs. I didn't know him before, but we started working at the same time. Our offices were right next to each other. We lived in the same building downtown. We did everything together at work and outside of work. We were, he was my BFF. You can say we had a little bit of a bromance going on, <laughs> if you will. And the interesting thing for this story about Hans is he's from Denmark. And Hans has this propensity to walk around life complaining about everything. He would literally continuously talk about how bad, how much Denmark sucked. Denmark has high taxes. Denmark's weather is awful. Uh, the food in Denmark is horrible. But you know, Ryan, you ought to really bring your family to, for a visit sometime. <laughs> All right? So one day in the lunch uh, faculty lounge, we're sitting there, Hans and I at a table, eating lunch together, minding our own business, and there are other faculty around. And He's railing about Denmark again and how much it sucks. And one of our colleagues at the table next to us, a, a gentleman by the name of Gene Fama, sitting at the other table, interjects and goes, uh, excuse me, Hans and Ryan. And at this point, we're like over the moon because for those of you that don't know who Gene Fama is, he's the, mo the father of modern finance and also went on to win the 2014 Nobel Prize in economics. So he interjects, he goes, excuse me, I couldn't help but under overhear your conversation. Hans, how is it that you say such bad things about Denmark, about how bad the weather is, how bad the food is? But literally yesterday, I just read a headline in the paper that said, according to the World Health Organization, Denmark is the happiest country on earth. And it's true. Denmark is consistently, across all rankings, the highest, happiest country on earth. How is it, Hans? that you and, quite frankly, other Danish people that I know are very pessimistic. And Hans gave, me, gave an answer to Jean that gave me pause to think about what drives happiness. Hans looked at him and said, oh, well, that's easy, because Danes have zero expectations, so we're always pleasantly surprised. <laughs> and it's true. He's right. If you have zero expectations, you're always pleasantly surprised. The only problem, 
with that is don't set your expectations at zero because it does have other effects, okay? Don't set your expectations at zero. For example, I'm not gonna go to Denmark anytime soon. And so it does have an influence. My point is, in the face of ambiguity, an ambiguous world, you wanna really focus on setting expectations because oftentimes our happiness is tied to how surprised, pleasantly or not pleasantly, we are. And how surprised we are by events depends on two different things, two key things. One is the actual outcome, the future outcome that oftentimes is way out of our control. But the one other thing that it depends on is our expectations, how we set those expectations. And so that is something that's within your control. And so one of the things I would highly recommend, and it's worked for me as I've gone through dealing, learning how to navigate an ambiguous world, because that is a crucial skill for uh, uh, people going out in the workforce today, set expectations appropriately. Don't always undersell yourself. Think about what I did for my students who took my class. You may or may not remember, but we only meet for 12 class meetings. I've got very little precious time to teach you. But I took an entire hour out of the first class to literally go over the entire course ad nauseum. Why? Because I was trying to set your expectations appropriately. And what did I utter sometimes? If this isn't what you're expecting, drop the class, right? Obviously, setting expectations in that manner has made not only you happy, but also me happy. So it works. Set expectations appropriately. Now, as a postscript to this story, uh, this first story, uh, I will follow up and tell you that the good news is Hans did eventually find happiness. After moving here four years ago, he came for a visit. We went to the University of Michigan Akron football game, uh, which he looked thoroughly confused because I don't think he'd ever seen a football game before, but I definitely know he was happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I got to send him a tape of the, uh, the talk here. Okay, story number two. Story number two is one that I'm really interested in. I hope you are too. <laughs> it's about the ultimate fighting championship and expecting change in the face of ambiguity. A lot of you saw the MMA uh, uh, acronym in my, the title of my talk. Well, that stands for Mixed Martial Arts. So what is the Ultimate Fighting Championship? The Ultimate Fighting Championship is the largest company in the world that promotes and organizes mixed martial arts fighting, similar to a boxing promoter, if you will. And usually they're recognized by their trademark arena that the two uh, fighters fight in, uh, called an octagon. Okay, and so the ultimate fighting championship, what does that have to do with ambiguity? Well, I'm not sure either, but we're gonna talk about ultimate fighting for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so ultimate fighting championship. Now, I'm well aware that some people may find the brutal violence objectionable. Try to put that aside for the, the sake of this talk because that's not what this, this talk is about at all. What this talk is about is actually the company itself. The company, the UFC, is huge. It's actually a multi-billion dollar company. With last year, they had over $500 million in revenues, and they're only growing and growing. That's up from their market cap of only $1 million back in 1998, a huge return on investment. It is a massively growing company. But it hasn't always been the case. What I wanna talk about is why the UFC actually started. So let's go back to 1993, when they had the Ultimate Fighting Championship one, UFC one. It was basically touted as a no holds barred, quote, there are no rules. That was the, the catchphrase, there are no rules. Why is that important? Because prior to 1993, you had all types of fighting styles that existed in their own isolated arenas. You had boxers. They played by one set of rules. You can't hit below the belt. You certainly aren't allowed to kick. And you certainly aren't allowed to throw somebody to the ground. It was all boxing. 
wrestling. Wrestling, there was no punching. The idea was to get people on, your, on their back, and that's where you didn't want to be, is on your back. But you certainly weren't allowed to punch. Uh, karate, you were allowed to wear karate keys. You were allowed to hit, kick, punch. So each of these different fighting styles coexisted in their own little arenas. And it was only a theoretical debate as to which of those champions would actually uh, win if you actually put them all in a, an arena. So the UFC was actually the ultimate empirical experiment to answer that question. If you put different fighters with different fighting styles into the arena, which one would come out as the most efficient style of fighting? The only impediment to answering that question was the fact that each sport had different rules. And so the only way to answer that was to take away all rules, period. And so Ultimate Fighting 1 involved eight different fighters. It was a single elimination tournament style. Up on the top left, you had a gentleman named Art Jemerson, who was a professional boxer on a 20-match uh, winning streak. Down at the bottom, you had Ken Shamrock. Looks like he was chiseled out of stone. Each of these eight people were champions in their own respective fighting styles. They hadn't been beat. And they're all thrown into the single elimination tournament. So let's talk about what actually happened because it was surprised a lot of people and changed the world of fighting forever. Let's take the fight between Art Jimerson and Hoist Gracie. It was the second fight up. It's basically between the two smallest guys on the card by far. Each was about five foot 11 and 180 pounds soaking wet. If I can just go back and point out this guy right here. <laughs> he looks like he ate the other seven. I mean, <laughs> ouch. Uh, and so these are the two smallest guys in the, the, uh, in the match. But what happened is very, very interesting and hopefully has some sort of lesson for you. Here they are squaring off. They ring the bell and they come out fighting. Art Jimerson, the boxer, is on the left. Hoist Gracie, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert, is on, I guess, your right, uh, in the white gi with the black belt. And they square off. Commentators were actually very, very, very concerned that Gracie was going to have his head knocked clean off by Art Jimerson, who packed a powerful punch. So if you want to look, think about who's going to win this fight, Think about it as a relative valuation. What are the assets of the boxers, right? <laughs> well, come on. I mean, you got to use something from accounting. All right. Let's take a look. So if we're valuing the boxer, what are his assets? Number one, he's got shoes on. That gives you traction to move around and, and actually uh, uh, get some traction. Uh, he's not wearing a shirt. He's got his belt pulled up because in boxing, you're not allowed to hit below the belt. So the higher it is, the higher they have to hit you. Okay? He's also not wearing a shirt, so he can breathe, sweat a lot easier. Uh, he's also got a glove on. Most people make the mistake of thinking that boxers wear gloves to protect the face of their opponent. In fact, it's actually there to protect their hand from getting broken and therefore allows them to punch much, much harder. He's got a glove on. As opposed to his opponent, Hoist Gracie, who nobody really had heard of at that point, he comes out, he's not wearing shoes, he has no gloves or tape on his hands. And he's wearing this heavy, thick uh, karate gi, which is not going to allow him to breathe. And so everybody's expecting Art Jimerson, the boxer, to come in and just knock this guy's head clean off. But what happened next literally changed the course of fighting for the next 25 years. Hoist Gracie comes in, Art Jimerson, the boxer, who's used to having distance, Gracie converges, gets a hold of him, and puts the guy on his back. A boxer has never, ever been on his back before like this. Even worse, think about the nature of his assets in the boxing ring. That glove that he's wearing is actually now a liability because he can't grab on to get out of there. <laughs> Also, that, kar that karate gi that looks so heavy and sweaty is now becoming something to grab onto and start to choke the guy. 
This fight lasted about two minutes before the referee just stopped and said, the guy's crying, uncle, let him up, okay? And so Gracie goes on to defeat Art Jemerson so easily. Up next, a guy named Ken Shamrock. This guy literally looks like he was chiseled out of stone. ABC News dubbed him the world's most dangerous man. Well, they square off. Shamrock is just amped. Gracie, this is the second round, is now much, much smaller than Ken Shamrock. Well, guess what? The world's most dangerous man had the world's shortest fight. It lasted 30 seconds. Gracie jumped on top of him and choked him out the same way he did Art Jimerson. Up next, a six degree black belt. Uh, he lasted about a minute and the rest is history. Gracie went on to win UFC one, the prize and everything else that comes along with it. And what people discovered is that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is one of the most effective fighting styles out there. And what he took advantage of, he took advantage of those other fighters unwillingness to realize they were no longer in their home court. This was a different arena and they hadn't prepared for it. The boxer came in expecting to fight a boxing match, but was surprised when somebody put him on his back. Gracie exploited that. So why am I telling you all this, okay? I have no doubt that most of you are never going to step foot into an octagon to fight. But if you do, let me know, because I'd like to show up and see that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but you are going to find yourself in ambiguous arenas that you've never been in before. This is a metaphor for a globalizing economy. What works well in the US may not necessarily work as well as the strategy when you find yourself competing against a Chinese competitor. They don't have, for example, the same pollution standards that we do in the US. How are you going to adapt? Here at the University of Michigan, you're bound by a student honor code, but long after you leave the University of Michigan, you may have to deal with people who don't necessarily follow the same moral compass as you. How are you going to deal with that? I can't tell you how you're gonna deal with it because I don't know what arena you're gonna be in. Having said that though, take time to prepare and assess what environment you're going into because things change quickly. That's not the end of the story though. That's not the end of the story because 10 years later, well, let me, let me back up and uh, uh, say, Gracie actually went on to win UFC one, two, I don't think he fought in three, four and five. He retired undefeated after that and went into the UFC Hall of Fame. He disappeared into oblivion, went back and perfected his jujitsu craft like nobody else could. He's one of the highest black belts uh, ranks in the world. 10 years after UFC one, Hoist Gracie decides to return to the UFC to fight again. Again, he's a Hall of Famer at this point. He's never been beaten in the ring. And he's 10 years better at Jiu Jitsu. So at UFC 60, he squares off against this guy, Matt Hughes. And Matt Hughes is actually much, much, much smaller than Hoist Gracie. I think he stands about five foot seven, weighs a little bit less than him as well. So he's nowhere even near the size of those guys that Gracie made mincemeat out of. And so Matt Hughes also is probably about an average skill level of jujitsu, whereas Gracie's like a umpteenth degree black belt. This just seems like a lopsided thing. Matt Hughes was also a former wrestler in college, okay? So why do I show this to you? Because Hoist Gracie could have taken note from the lesson he inflicted on other people. They come out in this fight just like they did before. And in typical Gracie fashion, the fight lasts about two whole minutes. The problem is this time it was Matt Hughes who demolished Hoist Gracie in two minutes flat beating him by using a combination 
of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, boxing, wrestling, you name it, he had it in there. In other words, over the course of 10 years, the world had moved on from UFC 1, and it had evolved. But Gracie forgot to evolve with it. A new breed of fighter was out there called a mixed martial artist in which everybody has to know a little bit about every single fighting aspect out there. So what I will tell you today and what this has to do with facing ambiguity, we've tried to prepare you in our classes uh, as professors to send you off into your post-Michigan life We've given you facts, but we've also given you tools to adapt. So make sure that you use those tools because the second you leave this university, there are three things in life I can guarantee you, or four actually, because I forgot I'm talking to my students. Uh, <laughs> death, taxes, accounting rules will change. And more broadly, the world's gonna change. I don't know what the world's gonna look like tomorrow, but I do know for a fact that it'll look different than it does today. And so when you get out of school and leave this university, make sure that you make the investment back in the most important asset of all, yourself. Don't stop learning. Even though your formal education may be done, strive to reinvest by continuously learning. Because when you're out there in the real world, the world's gonna become your university and the people in it, your professors. Okay, that's enough. Uh, There were no jokes in that one, so. <laughs> okay, all right. My last story is one that's near and dear to my heart. It's about improv comedy and the concept of embracing ambiguity, learning to just accept it as a given, even though there's nothing that you're ever going to be able to do about it. There are probably, I'm counting about, and they're all in my family, three people who actually, in this audience, who actually knew me 10 years ago. Uh, and 10 years ago, people would be surprised to know, and this is 100% true, and no, I don't have a prom picture to prove it. You just have to take me on my word for it. If there were a funeral, as Jerry Seinfeld once said, I, would have, I was the guy who would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. I was deathly afraid of public speaking. No joke. I would stress about it. Whenever I had to do it, it would just drive me crazy. I would literally go out of my way to avoid it like the plague. I would make up excuses because I was scared of what was going to happen. I would sit there and try to pay down what if somebody asked me this? What if somebody asked me that? Oh my God, what if I fall flat on my face? What's gonna happen? And the problem is, every time I answered one of those questions, two more questions would appear. It drove me insane. Unfortunately, I knew it was part of my, gonna be part of my job because I was in a PhD program at the time. And so I was a little bit worried about that. And then one Saturday morning in a, uh, let's see, I guess it'd be about 2006, a funny thing happened, something that had never happened before. I went grocery shopping. <laughs> I never went grocery shopping with my wife, ever. But it just so happened that my son at the time was about two years old, and uh, so I went with them. And it was down in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I got my PhD, was getting my PhD at the time. And we're shopping around, and my son's getting fidgety. And there happened to be some railroad tracks running alongside of the grocery store, okay? railroad tracks running alongside the grocery stores that had some old vintage trains. And so he was getting a little fussy, so we, you know, we both agreed I'd take him out there, walk him down the railroad tracks, and uh, uh, take a look at the trains. So we come out of the store, and we're walking down the railroad tracks looking at them. You know, we go about a, I'd say about a quarter of a mile down. At this point, I'm behind the grocery store. And so I said, come on, bud, let's turn around and go back. And so I, we're walking back, and all I can see is the back of the grocery store. And of course, they have their loading docks and semis loading and unloading all their cargo. But right off the back corner are these tinted windows. It almost looks like some sort of office. And it's got some writing on the windows. And I can't really read it from, from where I am. I said, 
hey, let's go check out what that is. I'm kind of curious. So I take my son, we go up, it's up on a loading dock, and I go into this room. And the room is probably, actually it's probably smaller than the stage itself, but it's got about 100 chairs in it, just folding chairs, just sitting in the middle of the room, and at the end is the stage. And a guy comes out and says, oh, can I help you? And I said, oh, what is this place? He goes, oh, it's an improv comedy studio. Oh, okay, tell me more. So he proceeded to tell me about improv comedy, which I literally knew nothing about. And if you don't know what improv comedy is, maybe you've seen Whose Line Is It Anyway? Where here's the basic idea of improv comedy. You have a bunch of people up on stage who are expected to make a performance. But here's where the improv comes in. They don't know what the actual thing is going to be about, the performance is going to be about. It's completely ambiguous. They have basically an MC who kind of helps narrate things, but they basically solicit ideas from the audience. In other words, when you get up there to perform in front of people, you literally have no idea what you're going to actually have to do. It's the ultimate ambiguous situation. Even worse, you've got three other people on stage with you that you have to coordinate with. And so he then said, oh, we offer classes if you're interested. And I said, okay, that sounds interesting. I literally just thought it sounded interesting. I had no idea it was connected to public speaking whatsoever. And so I go in and I take this six week course. It's six weeks, we do all these drills. It's amazing, I mean, little subtle things. Uh, learning to respond to somebody by saying yes and, rather than saying yes but, which destroys the energy in the room versus increasing the energy. Little small types of uh, tweaks like that uh, really went a long way. And so at the end of the fifth uh, and second to last uh, uh, class, the instructor said, oh, I'll see you guys next week at the performance. And I said, what? <laughs> performance? What performance? He goes, oh yeah, at the end of the class, the requirement is that you actually give a improv performance in front of a live audience. I'm like, suck. <laughs> <laughs> so then the panic ensues, right? But thanks to my wife, she convinced me that I should do it. And so I show up and there are 100 people. And to make the matters worse, they charge people $5 to get in. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I literally wanted to get out my checkbook and just be like, I'm sorry, thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> And I remember finding myself just standing up on stage going, oh my God, what if they ask me this? What if I'm supposed to act like a squirrel? What if I, you know, oh my, what if I'm supposed to act like a kid? I don't know what to do. I was getting into the same old familiar panic that I had before. I got up on stage with three other people and I remember it as clear as day where I stood up there and it felt like somebody had just doused me with a, a bucket of water because all of the worry and anxiety of presenting just washed away because I suddenly realized no matter how much I worry about this, there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. And the best strategy, instead of spending all my time worrying about it, is spend my time enjoying it and rolling with the punches. And it turns out I was fine. And even better, I actually had fun doing it. It was amazing. And so several of you have actually come into my office and <laughs> it's funny, uh, I actually, my PhD students will come into my office uh, occasionally and say, so what, what, what courses should we take as PhD students? And they're expecting me to say like math or econ or something like that. And I tell them, take an improv comedy class because it is the best tool for getting you used to ambiguity. It allows you to focus on what you're doing and just get rid of the worry that you're not gonna know what you're gonna do. So, of all of the very, very eclectic topics I've talked about tonight, if there's one tangible takeaway, <laughs> I would recommend go out and take an improv comedy class. <laughs> and more importantly, do the performance. And if you do, please send me an email. I will be right in the front row cheering you on like everybody else. Okay, so that concludes my three stories. Um, 
The last thing I want to leave with you with tonight, uh, so that you can get out there to that lovely Zingerman's uh, 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 catering out there, I'm honored to have been considered such an important teacher in your life. But I also have to acknowledge all of the important teachers in my life because I couldn't be a great teacher without all of these great influences in my life. And I just want to spend a few minutes acknowledging them. First of all, to my mom. Unfortunately, she was supposed to be here, but she, uh, she couldn't. Uh, to my mom, uh, she taught me Basically, where there's a will, there's a way. No experience necessary. All you need is willpower. To my dad, who's down here in the audience, the consummate politician, always taught me the value of a, hand, a firm handshake and looking somebody in the eye to make a connection that will last a lifetime. My fifth grade teacher, Mr. Chuck Carroll, <laughs> who really inspired me to be enthusiastic about learning in the first place. Mr. Bob Mars, he was my high school history teacher. He has two notable contributions to my life. First, he taught me the value of history and taught me that history can be fun and actually very predictive of the future. The second and probably most important contribution to my life is that he assigned me a seat right next to a woman named Sarah. Yeah. A woman named Sarah who has been with me ever since and <clears throat> really my rock and provided me two great kids that inspire, inspire me every day. Uh, whew, okay. <laughs> Maybe I do need those tissues. All right. <laughs> All right, Dr. Eric Steinberg, he was an engineering professor of mine. He taught me how to teach with courage and conviction. A special debt of gratitude. I know some of my colleagues here know him as quite the character. Uh, Robert Bushman. He was my PhD advisor in, at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. But he was more than an advisor. He was really more like a second father to me. Uh, I, I can't say enough about the man, and I pretty much owe him everything uh, for my professional career. Uh, also, my colleagues at the Ross School of Business, especially those from my department, uh, I probably have one of the best area chairs known to man, uh, Professor Roby Lahavi. The guy, ever since I got here, has literally made it so easy for me to go into the classroom and do what I do. He has run interference for me on all the mundane details of dealing with the administration that <laughs> I can't, uh, I can't, I literally can't uh, offer my uh, gratitude enough. Uh, others, including, uh, uh, Rafi and Dijikian, uh, Venki Nagar, who always manages to uh, drop a pearl of wisdom in at the, the right moment. And uh, finally, a crowd favorite. Anybody guess? Greg Miller. <laughs> and his gorgeous curly hair. No, I, you know, I, I, I make fun of Greg in class, and that's only, I swear it's only to keep the continuity between what you learned in his and mine. But I teach downstream from Greg. He teaches the introductory class. I teach the intermediate class. And Greg has done a fabulous job preparing you all in his introductory course before you come into my course, which makes my job so much easier. Greg, he's also taught me uh, how to be a deep and conscientious thinker but also to balance it with an eye towards practicality. And so Greg, uh, Greg's sons are in my son's uh, grade, and so I've gotten to know him outside of, uh, outside of the business school. So I not only consider him a colleague, but I also consider him a dear friend and a mentor. That's it. I also want to thank you for coming out and celebrating with me. I'm really moved by the outpouring of support. Uh, you always know where to find me long after you've graduated. So I do hope you'll keep in touch because I'd love to hear from you again. Thank you. Thank you.
So in addition to um, receiving this honor, we do actually have a physical award for oh, you. Cool. So you can display that in your office for everybody that you meet to come and see. Oh. So officially um, awarding you the Golden Apple Award. On behalf this of the year. Golden Apple Thank Committee. You. Thank you for Thank you.